Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. I am Alex. With me is my co-hosts, Julia and Noel. Say hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. And we are here to discuss a very special film, and that film is Halloween. <laughs> the iconic score, of course, of Halloween. In my best tone death fashion. Uh, I appreciated the effort. So what is everybody's history with this movie so far? My history is, I don't even remember the first time I saw it. I started watching horror films very late in my life because I'm a big chicken. I remember it was probably just one of the ones that was either on TV that I decided to be brave and watch, or my friends and I got from our local Jumbo video and I fell in love. And I've seen it a million billion times. <laughs> I saw it one other time when Alex showed it to me, what, maybe three years ago? Yeah. Four? Yeah. Even? One other time. <laughs> Back when we were watching a lot more horror movies. Yes. Mm -hmm. I usually watch it with my best pal. Sometimes not with you. Sometimes it is, but usually not. <laughs> Anyways, no. Exactly like you, um, Al I almost said Jack. I forget who I'm co-hosting with tonight. <laughs> Got too many podcasts. <laughs> yes. I can call you Jack. Yes, like you, Alex, I was an absolute wimp when it came to horror until my teens. I actually think it was around Scream, around the time that came out, probably, was it 95, 96, somewhere mm -hmm. around that time. And that really got me into the slasher movement, which then led me to the broader horror genre. So I saw this one, I was probably around 14, 15 when I first saw it. I would agree with that. And I should also say, around when I was 16 was when I started collecting screenplays. Halloween was one of the very first screenplays I ever bought. Very nice. So, anyways, should I get into some little production history to the film? Sure, yeah. I have a lot of stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> the film was directed and co-written by John Carpenter, who also composed the score. The co-writer and producer was Deborah Hill, who was the script supervisor on Assault in Precinct 13. She was in a relationship with Carpenter at the time and based much of the script on her own experiences as a teenage babysitter in a small town. Now, other ideas for the film came from a few different sources. When he was taking a psychology course at USC, Carpenter visited an asylum where he saw a young, pale man staring blankly. A lot of Sam Loomis's dialogue describing Michael Myers is based on this. Then, are, have either of you seen Black Christmas? Yes. No. Okay, so Black Christmas, as one of you will know. <laughs> <laughs> you should have Julia watch it. I think she'd enjoy it. I will make her watch it, no problem. Black Christmas is one of the predecessors to the slasher genre, which... Halloween is typically credited with having created, while Black Christmas did a lot of the same things earlier. It wasn't until Halloween that they really caught on as a trend. That film was directed by Bob Clark, who was working with John Carpenter on the script for Prey. And during that time, according to Bob Clark in a few interviews, John Carpenter kept telling him how much he liked Black Christmas and asked him, what would he do if he ever did a sequel? And one of the things Bob Clark said was, I'd have him escape from an asylum. Now, despite this, Bob Clark does not take any credit on the movie. He says it's entirely John's thing. He loves the film. He loves Carpenter's work. So he's not like trying to say, it was all my work. Mm -hmm. And then executive producer Erwin Yablons wanted to make a film initially for TV called The Babysitter Murders. And Carpenter would only accept the job if he got full creative freedom and final cut and eventually agreed with Yablons to later change the film to Halloween and set the entire thing around that date. And you'll see in earlier versions of the film, it even credits Erwin Yablons with From an Original Idea By. So he does actually receive some credit on that. Sometimes it pops up on IMDb, sometimes it doesn't. People keep adding it and dropping it. Cool. So people that we've mentioned in past episodes are Nick Castle, who plays Michael Myers, except in the shot where we see his face. Tommy Lee Wallace, the production designer and co-editor. PJ Souls, who plays Linda. Yay. Nancy Loomis, a.k.a. Nancy Kyes, who plays Annie. Charles Cyphers, who plays Sheriff Brackett, the property master and set designer Craig Stearns, assistant art director Randy Moore, and Kyle Richards, who plays Lindsay as the little sister of Kim Richards, the girl from Assault on Precinct 13. So some new names to bring up. Jamie Lee Curtis would go on to appear in The Fog and Escape from New York, as well as three other Halloween films, and then, of course, went on to become a big Hollywood star. 
Donald Pleasance went on to appear in Escape from New York and Prince of Darkness, as well as four other Halloween films. And he was also in Better Late Than Never, another TV movie that Carpenter wrote, but we won't be covering that here as it's not available in any form. That's one that seems to have been lost to the sands of time. Oh, wow. So anyways, Nancy Stevens, who plays the nurse Marion, went on to appear in Escape from New York, as well as two other Halloween films. She's married to Rick Rosenthal, the director of Halloween's 2 and 8. Robert Phelan, who plays Dr. Wynn, he's the guy who's arguing with Dr. Loomis there early in the film, he went on to appear in Someone's Watching Me and Starman. Now, the executive producer, Mustafa Akkad, or Mustafa Akkad, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, I hope I'm doing it right. He was a Syrian-born filmmaker who directed The Message, which was the story of Muhammad, and The Lion in the Desert. I've seen Lion in the Desert, it's a very good Lawrence of Arabia-style epic. He didn't go on to do much else outside of producing all eight of the original Halloween films. And in 2005, him and his daughter were visiting a hotel in Jordan when a suicide bomber went off and killed them both. Yeah. And his son, Malik, he co-produced the last three Halloween films with his dad and then produced the remake and its sequel. So Erwin Yablons then went on to executive produce the next two Halloween films. Dean Cundy, the cinematographer, he would also shoot The Fog, Escape from New York, Halloween's 2 and 3, The Thing, and Big Trouble in Little China, and then became one of the top names in the industry when he worked on the Back to the Future trilogy, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, for which he was nominated for an Oscar, Hook, Jurassic Park, Death Becomes Her. His camera assistant on most of these, Raymond Stella, then went on to become the main cinematographer on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV series. Barry Bernardi, who plays the dead mechanic, was also a production assistant on the film. He'd go on to be associate producer and location manager on Escape from New York, the associate producer on Fog, Halloween's 2 and 3, and Christine, and co-producer of Starman. He continues producing to this day, producing almost everything that Adam Sandler does. <laughs> Arthur Mallet, who plays the graveyard keeper. Have either of you seen Hook? Yes. Hook, of course. Do you remember Toodles, the old guy who lost his marbles? Sure yeah. do. Oh. That's the graveyard keeper in this movie. Oh, very cool. I did not know that. And Hook was, of course, written and co-produced and was meant to be directed by Nick Castle, the guy who plays Michael Myers. Oh, wow. So co-editor Charles Bornstein would also cut The Fog and Vampires Los Muertos. The script supervisor, Louise Jaffe, went on to escape from New York and Halloween 3. She's since been the script supervisor for the entirety of The Simpsons. Hmm. Sound mixer, Tom, we're almost done here. We're down to the sound mixer. Sound mixer Thomas Causey went on to do Escape from New York, Halloween's 2 and 3, The Thing, Christine, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, Village of the Damned, and Escape from L.A. He was nominated for an Oscar for his work on Dick Tracy. Huh. Stunt coordinator Jim Winburn went on to do The Fog and Escape from New York. And makeup artist Eric Whelan and production manager Don Burns also went on to do The Fog. <sighs> Almost done. Just a couple more <laughs> notes. In terms of character names, Sheriff Lee Brackett is named after novelist and screenwriter Lee Brackett whom Lee from Assault on Precinct 13 was also named after. Cool. Sam Loomis is both a nod to actress Nancy Loomis, as well as the character Sam Loomis from Psycho, who was the boyfriend of the character played by Janet Lee, who is, of course, the mother of Jamie Lee Curtis. And the Janet Lee character was named Marion, which here is the name of the nurse. And on a final note, there is an extended cut of the film that has a few, I want to say about six minutes of extra scenes. These are actually scenes that were filmed during the shoot of Halloween 2, because when Halloween was going to be played on TV, they had to cut so much out in terms of the censorship that they had extra time they needed to fill. And since they were shooting Halloween 2, they were like, okay, let's just throw together a few scenes of some people talking. So that's all I have for the production history of the film. Very Any thoughts? No, I have no thoughts. It's very cool, very in-depth, and very fascinating. I've always wondered about the Loomis name, because that appears in Psycho, Halloween, and Scream, Billy Loomis's character as well. Oh, yeah, and Scream has tons of references to this. Oh, very much so, including chunks of the score, because they're watching it on TV. Right. Run down the street to the McKenzie's. Yeah, oh, really? Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, that's a line that's in Scream, too. That's amazing. I love Scream. It's the first movie I snuck into the theater to go see at 17. Ooh. Yes, it terrified me. I'd never seen a slasher. I didn't see it till it hit video. Oh, yeah. I was just curious because all my friends at school were talking about it. I had no idea. I knew nothing about it. I went in knowing nothing. I don't even think I saw a trailer and someone said it was a scary movie. I didn't know what a slasher was. I just thought it would be like a suspense film and it destroyed my mind. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And after I saw Scream, I then became enamored with the slasher genre. I went and saw Psycho. I went and saw Halloween. I saw Nightmare on Elm Street. I saw Terror Train. I saw Prom Night. I saw all the big ones from the 80s and some of the predecessors. And there was the entire 90s slasher movement that of I kind of got yes. sucked up in. Yeah, yeah. I know what you did last summer. Urban <laughs> Legend. I know what you did last summer. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Good times. Valentine. Yep, yep. <laughs> David Boreanaz classic. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, anybody else got anything to add before I do the synopsis? No, I think that's pretty good. I think we can uh, move right into the synopsis for sure. Thankfully, one nice tight paragraph. Ah, there you go. So, Haddonfield, Illinois, October 31st, 1963. Six-year-old Michael Myers, costume for trick-or-treating, stabs his teenage sister to death after she has sex with her boyfriend. Fifteen years later, Michael escapes from an asylum and heads back home, his harried psychiatrist Sam Loomis on his tail. While Loomis struggles to get the local sheriff's office to take things seriously, Michael starts stalking Lori Strode, a sheltered babysitter often left covering for her friends Annie and Linda when they skip out of their sitting jobs to spend time with their boyfriends. That night, Michael kills the other two girls and attacks Lori when she wanders into his grisly tableau. She flees and fights off Michael long enough for Loomis to arrive with a drawn revolver and blow the killer out the window. But when they reach the ground below, his body is gone. So Halloween. That pretty much sums it up. Very succinct. <laughs> so do the two of you recommend Halloween? 100%. Sure. <laughs> Julia's going to uh, have some opinions on this one. I could feel it coming off her when she was writing her notes. <laughs> it's okay. It makes it more interesting. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah, I love Halloween. It's. I feel I can recommend it, but I'm also too close to this movie, so this is going to be an interesting episode. This is a near and dear movie to me, so let's criticize it. Looking at it critically, I've got some beefs now. Julia? Yeah? Do you recommend the film? Yeah, sure. It wasn't a bad movie or anything. I liked a lot of parts of it. I just, I'm not, it doesn't mean to me what it means to you guys. You can so. be totally brutally honest. You're not going to offend either of us. You know, I like a, it's not in my heart. There you go. <laughs> you suck and I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I'll flip a table. It's cool. <laughs> Noel? Hang on, I'm trying to debate if I can flip a table at all my recording equipment is on. <laughs> now, I, I love the movie. Again, like Alex, I'm probably too close to it. It's a film I've seen so many times over and over again. I'm kind of glad that in the last couple of years I've kind of slowed that down. I don't think I've watched the film since we did it on remakes two years ago. Mm. So it's nice always having a little bit of that space, but it's like finding a childhood blanket and you just wrap yourself up <laughs> in it. I, I don't know that I can divorce myself and pull my viewpoint away from that. Which, of course, I will do and say that it is a very slowly paced film. Absolutely. It does occasionally betray its cheap budget, especially in a few of the makeup effects. Mm -hmm. But it's so brief. Those bits are so brief. That's true. That it's just, I love the build of the movie. I love the casual everyday setting of the movie, superimposed against this gloom and doom atmosphere of just oppressive, wom, wom, wom. Mm -hmm. you know, it's an enveloping movie. It slowly lulls you in and then springs on you. I love the cast. I, lo I Michael Myers. I've been him for multiple Halloweens. <laughs> One of my favorite screen icons is Michael Myers. I just I love this movie. It's everything I, I look for. I, I can't I talk. I'm too busy sucking it off. <laughs> it is one of my all-time favorite movies and has been since I first saw it. So I guess we open the floor to discussion. Let's do this. I do think one of the main criticisms of this film is the pace. And I know people who have a hard time with this movie because of the pace. And it's not entirely because of looking back on it from a modern point of view. Because even at the time this movie came out, it was actually very negatively criticized. And a lot of the critics didn't like the pacing of it. A lot of critics thought it was too basic. It took a few years before critics actually kind of turned around on that with Roger Ebert actually being one of the positive spearheads of that. But I mean, it is a very precise pace. Yep, which I think is necessary for the movie, but I know a lot of people will disagree with that. So uh, we can discuss that as we go on. I have no notes here about the pace. I have no, no problem with that. No. Yeah, it's an independent I like horror film slow. that <laughs> is intentionally slowly building to a boil yeah. and then comes to a head. Like I've it's... just, yeah, I've gotten used to it too. Yeah. Like, because we've watched a few now, so I understand that he takes his time and I have mm. no problem with that. Absolutely. Because he does get to where he's going. Yeah, and I like being lulled as well. I have mm. no problem with that. I like being relaxed, yeah. like breathing, and then all of a sudden being taken out of that calmness. It's nice. For sure. It's not like it's a brown bunny. Like, it's going to do what it needs to do. Thank God it's not a Vincent Gallo movie. <laughs> I think we'd all be a lot sadder. Yes. <laughs> I think one of the things that, you know, at least for me, helps to overcome that very slow pace is the score. That it's always there with just the little pings, the deep heartbeat rhythm, this kind of loomingness. I mean, it's like Michael Myers is always looming behind his cast and that score is always looming above this movie. Absolutely. It's a very uh, menacing little town that they live in. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm just picturing Michael Myers, the loom. 
<laughs> behind you silently. <laughs> he's just staring at you as he's working the him killing you. <laughs> just staring at you. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of staring. There's a lot of longing looks. It's almost romantic. <laughs> He's very into these young women. And that's another thing that we should also get to, but let's do that a little bit later. What, the uh, cameo appearance by William Shatner? Oh, yeah, the Shatner mask. And just what is Michael Myers up to? Well, I don't get it. Like, I don't understand why he's attached himself to these women. I don't understand why he's stalking them and why they have to die. I don't get it. What's his motivation? Well, I mean, part of the reason that I like it is because there isn't an explanation for it. And this actually goes back to Black Christmas, where you never know who the killer is or why he's doing this. You never see his face. You never even hear his name. No, it's true. So, I mean, Black Christmas took it a step even further than this one. This one, it's more just a combination of he's so completely cut off from humanity that he just is blank. In the script, he's always just described as the shape. Yes. And he's just this blank face. And even when you see the mask taken off, he just has a blank face that looks exactly like the mask. Yeah, there's no expression on his face. But, like, knowing what you know from, like, the sequels, which I don't think, I don't know if we should discuss or not. Well, I'm kind of separating myself from the sequels because I know As they bring in a whole lot of backstory and try to give him motivation and reason. But yeah, at the time of this film, there wasn't any of that. No. Even Carpenter and Hill are on record as they didn't have a motivation for him. Yeah, you can tell. They didn't want him to have a motivation. It's very interesting in that regard. Like, I try to pick things out when they're discussing about how he was waiting for this night. And I'm just like, why was he waiting? They're, what? <laughs> why is it this night? Because it's just his ability to escape on that night. Other than that, it doesn't seem like the moons it's have to align it's... for it to be this year. It's also the night he killed his sister. Yes, it is yeah. the night he killed his sister. But it's, it's interesting for these three girls in particular. And at one point, he also stalks the boy, Tommy. He's following him outside of his school, which was interesting as well. And it came to nothing. Yeah. So it's like, does Tommy remind him of himself? Do the girls remind him of his sister? The sister thing has to come into play because of, and we're going right towards the end, the um, tombstone. The Judith Myers thing, yeah. yeah. That iconic image. Well, oh, going back so to the beginning, the POV shot of him, or as him mm. as a little boy, as being the killer. Did he invent that? Was that like the, the first POV time that shot? happened? Yeah. Oh, no. Well, I mean, I don't know if you remember our discussion of it in Eyes of Laura Mars. Yes, which Which had all the killings from first-person point of view, and then that yeah. came from Dario Argento's But like, film. like a Italian slasher films. movie type thing? Is that like a new thing, or is that just something uh, that's like, that oh, everyone does that? the Giallo films of Dario Argento in the early 70s. Yeah. He had an entire film where every kill was done from the first-person point of view, and then that was echoed in Eyes of Laura Mars, and then echoed here. And even on the commentary track, John Carpenter admits his influence by Dario Argento. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that he did not continue with the first person, because I think that dates your film incredibly. Well, I think that Halloween opening shot is probably the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you really could have taken the first person anywhere beyond that. Yeah, well, I mean, the first two Friday the 13th films are just point-of-view shots. <laughs> yeah, and they were just knocking it off the technique without really putting any weight to it. No, for sure. Don't get me wrong. Like, I love the opening shots with young Michael. It works perfectly. I love oh, yeah. that it's a limited view, which makes it kind of scary, and it keeps getting more limited as he puts the mask on, so you're kind of disoriented. It's really effective. Yeah, that's actually Deborah Hill's arm in the clown suit oh, that's always it? reaching out to grab stuff. Yeah. yeah, you can tell it's a grown-ass woman's arm. <laughs> it, yeah, I couldn't tell. <laughs> I could, because I, I don't know who it is, right? Yeah. So I thought it was like a psycho thing, or it's like the woman who's dressed like a man. And I'm, mm. like, I'm trying to like make all these plot points in the yeah. point. I'm like, well, that's a woman's arm, so... Yeah. No. Well, they didn't want to use a kid and all the stuff with, like, stabbing the topless woman and everything. That makes sense completely. But uh, the camera's a little bit too high for Michael's height. The arm is a little bit too far away from his line of sight, so he's got, like, extendo Freddy arms. I think part of that is also a fake-out if they don't want you to know that it's a kid until you see that it's a kid. Which was an interesting part of the movie, because I always knew it was going to be Michael Myers, but you didn't, Julia. No. So you thought they were trying to fake us out at certain parts. That I thought they were trying to fake us out through the whole movie. I was like, is that guy in it? Is the doctor in on it? Is it like him the whole time? What are we going to get to at the end where we're going to find... I need something. Some yeah. kind of motivation. Like, no dice. Nope. <laughs> but that's what Scream uses, because if you look at it, everyone does seem like a suspect. Loomis is too deep. The sheriff is a creep. There's all sorts of people that could be that killer. So I do appreciate that. But again... Yeah, I mean, Scream is very much kind of an elevation of this movie taking it in that direction of looking back on itself. I don't think the intention was to ever build suspects here. I think they wanted you to know right up front this is who it is. 
And then they had their big surprise in the beginning, and they didn't really have any other surprises except for the fact that he can't die. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Here's a surprise. I'm a teenage girl. Why am I incapable of fighting off a child? (laughs) That is very true. She does very little to defend herself. It's a big thing in horror films. No one ever, except for maybe a little bit of raising the arms, no one ever defends off. (laughs) And not only that, but the amount of power and strength it takes to put a butcher knife through someone's chest. Repeatedly. Are you admitting something? A child doesn't have that kind of strength, demon-filled or not. It would take a slight yeah. bat from your arm to get him off of you. There's a lot of parts in this film that don't make any realistic sense. No, you're just supposed to go with it. Not just there, but even when, like, Lori wanders into the room where all the other kids are killed, like, oh, that door just happens to open and he swings down. She backs into the corner. The door slowly opens. You know, whenever I enter a room and all of my friends have been killed, I like to see them in the order that they're killed. (laughs) (laughs) That's something Friday the 13th would do. She would always run into all the people that were killed in the order that they were killed. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where there are things that are done just in terms of cinematic storytelling with the hopes that you won't be bothered by the fact that they don't actually make logical sense. That's always my problem with Dario Argento is I think he goes way too far with that of just saying, fuck logic, I'm just going to do what I want. Mm -hmm. Carpenter, I think he does it more subtly. So for me, he gets away with it. But I mean, I can understand that not working for everyone. Yeah, there's a certain elements of like the physics not adding up, like certain people being places where they shouldn't, but it doesn't bother me at all, long story short. Right, and just the fact that, you know, Michael can always see everyone through the windows. Absolutely, he's always in the right place. You know, and he's always there and then he's not. I mean, it's done for cinematic technique. It's not done to be realistic, but, you know, again, that's not going to work for everyone. No, for sure. Rightfully so. Mm -hmm. And what was that thing you were talking about with the parents when they revealed that it was the kid? Oh, yeah. They're just standing there. Yeah, they're just standing there. They're not doing anything for, like, a minute. That's just because it's a boss shot. There's no reason for them to just be like, Michael! I think that they were just freezing the moment for that tableau. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it should have been one of them is trying to deal with the kid while the other one runs inside the house. You'd expect something to happen. But again, neither of those were actors. They were just local people who were there. (laughs) I've watched a bunch of movies. I speak cinema, so I let a lot of things go because I'm like, that's an amazing shot. So you did what you had to do, even though it doesn't completely make sense. (laughs) I think it's a little amateurish. A little amateurish. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, I think it is. I think you're making the story suffer in order to get the shot that you want. That is, I'm sorry, it's not good. (laughs) Well, maybe the dad was just going, whoa, (laughs) for a minute. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and then the mom is actually just sitting there relaxed with her hands in her pockets. Yeah, like, yeah, hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> this is really but then my again, kid. I, that's something that I didn't really notice until my later time seeing the film, because I was always watching Michael Myers. I only noticed a few things this time. It's like Jaws to me. It's like, the magic of cinema is right here. <laughs> and now I'm, I have, like, this is what we're doing. We're here to critique it, so. I mean, then also you have to remember they had a very, very tight shooting schedule and a budget of only $300,000. It's true. It was an independent film, the highest grossing independent film for many years until I think Blair Witch took over. And then that was beaten by another horror film, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. (laughs) You really hate that movie. I don't like My Big Fat Greek Wedding. It was bland. Yeah. But anyways, I mean, it's a film that has a lot of limitations against it. And I'm impressed with what he did with it. You know, we saw this with Dark Star. We saw this with Assault on Precinct 13. He can do really impressive stuff with a lot of limitations. Even Assault on Precinct 13 had a lot of problems with, like, you know, the shots of the gang members jumping in the windows didn't really look that good. Or bits where certain performances didn't quite work because he was kind of stuck with whoever he could get. So it's I understand it not working. Mm -hmm. For me, I go with it. Works for me. (laughs) But then again, I'm really close to this movie. Exactly, yeah. We're going to get touchy. We're going to have some fights. It's going to be some Breakfast Club moments, but we're going to make it through this. (laughs) Can I talk about the boss nurse? Like, the next scene is the nurse in the car driving with the doctor. Yeah, of course. I like the balls of this woman. (laughs) Where she has the windows rolled up and is smoking in the car. That's fine. I understand. It's the 70s. People smoked in the car with the windows up. But she's so cavalier. She's smoking with the hand that's closest to the doctor. Like, you can't even put it in the left. (laughs) (laughs) It's right in his face. And she's just lighting up cigarette after cigarette. Well, you think if you're driving with the cigarette, that's actually the hand that's closest to the ashtray. I know. It's rude. (laughs) (laughs) 
but I don't think she cares. Well, why do you think Sam Loomis looks so pissed? That's what I mean. It's like she's so brazen about it. Yeah, she's great. I think she comes back in like number seven or something. She pops up in two and then she's actually the opening scene in part seven. Yeah. H2O, yeah. She's great. She's one of my um, proofs that every supporting character could be a main character in a Carpenter film. <laughs> well, I will say that in later sequels of Halloween... Tommy Wallace, when he's grown up, is one of the main characters. It's true, yep. Lindsay the Girl is a supporting character in mm -hmm. one of the sequels. So, I mean, they did go back and mine this cast for all they could. Of course, <laughs> yeah. Just to <laughs> also have some continuity, because a lot of people still were sore about number three, which we can discuss another time. Well, why don't we talk about Donald Pleasance? I love him as Loomis. He's great. He definitely has that kind of harried Van Helsing quality. That's what I was going to say. He's the Van Helsing of the movie. Because some people are like, oh, he's the main character because he does this and that. I'm like, no, he's not. He's the Van Helsing. It's Laurie who's the main character. The first two choices for the character were Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Oh, wow. That would have been amazing. Christopher Lee actually got pretty far in negotiations, but ultimately had to turn it down because his schedule was too full. Oh, okay. And like a couple years later, he said that was one of the biggest mistakes of his life because he ended up loving the movie. Oh, that's great. Donald Pleasance was kind of a big character actor in the 60s. He had kind of fallen out of favor and was just doing small bit roles here and there. This was kind of a return for him. He ended up going on to some other roles. Unfortunately, he kind of got stuck just playing Loomis until literally he died while making Halloween 6. So, like, he shot half of his footage and the other half they kind of had to make up. <laughs> yeah, he dies off camera in Halloween 6. I still remember that. And then also doesn't die off camera because they mention him just dying of natural causes in part 7. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> well, part 7 had this whole thing of trying to remove all the other sequels, but I kind of have a headcanon of it still works. Yeah. We'll get to that should we get to Halloween 7. Absolutely. But yeah, he's got the weight, he's got the gravitas, he's delivering his lines really well. I also like his nervousness. Yeah, yeah, he's always nervous. He has a little fun sometimes. He, he makes fun of some kids. <laughs> like when he whips out the gun and the sheriff is looking at him, he's like, oh, hey, I, got, I got a permit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he does it really well. He's very subtle, very underplayed. I'm a fan. Julia? Um... <sighs> <laughs> You can say whatever you want. Not <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be you don't have to be gushing. I think I just had a problem with he was not proactive enough for me. He has been spending 15 years of his time with this crazy killer. I want you at the police station. I want you holding on to people's lapels and screaming. I want you calling friends so they can call their friends. He spent the whole movie standing in front of the house, basically waiting for the killing spree to be over. Not realizing that the car was across the street. So that he could come back and then see him. That's true. I need him to try harder. I'm sorry, it's not good enough. And then yeah. he, like he's not trying throughout the whole movie, and then he gets to have the end. He does get the hero movement at the end. The hero. I'll agree with that. Yeah, that's totally fair. This time I watched that, I'm like, wow, he's been at that house forever. For hours and hours and hours, not doing anything. In fact, he even stopped the police from looking for him. He did actually stop them from putting out an all-points bulletin. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We don't want to do that. <laughs> I think part of that is the limitations of they only had select locations and a limited shooting time, so they couldn't have him running all over the place. But yeah, I'll agree. He could have been more proactive in his search for Michael, or at least even just take longer for him to get to Haddonfield. Yeah, a little bit more. Like, have it when he's going through the countryside and he finds the truck with the clothes and the van. Have that, like, be the midpoint of the movie. Yeah, absolutely. And have him show up, like, leading us into the third act. For sure. It doesn't change anything by him being there. Because him and the sheriff talking and then finding the dead dog in the house, that could be leading into the third act as they then see the car across the street. Mm -hmm, for sure. You know, you don't need to have him just come that early in the film and then stand there. Because Michael's also there almost a little too early. Because when I look back on it, I remember, like, he gets the mask later, but that's not true. He's already there. Oh, yeah, that's part of the break-in at the store that the sheriff is investigating. Which they're investigating well after the fact that he's there. But again, I don't really know the times there. So that could be within, like, the first hour of her getting off of school. Yeah. No, because he's there when she goes to school because he's watching her drop the keys off in the mat. He's there first yeah. thing in the morning. Okay, so he's... Then that... He store drove have, through the night. And he's wearing the mask, so that store must have been robbed at least eight hours because the alarm Alarm going, going yeah. off <laughs> that long. All right, fair enough. And oh. yet the sheriff isn't at the store already. He bumps into Lori as she's walking down the street. That's true. He isn't. He does bump into her. I don't think her. he's doing his job very well. No, he isn't. <laughs> there are timeline inconsistencies in this Yeah, movie. and then they stop to talk to him, which they did not have to do. They did not have to stop to talk to him after they were smoking weed. <laughs> they could have just kept Keep driving. driving. Yeah, he was at work. He did not need to speak to you. <laughs> no. There was a cut line after they pull away 
he uh, turns to Sam Loomis and he's just shaking his head going, oh, they're smoking that crazy grass again. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> any cop would have smelled that. <laughs> yeah. Because they didn't take a time to like lower the windows and just fan out the air. Yeah. No, they were just like, hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> So I was asking Alex before because I wasn't sure. So she goes to drop off the keys in the morning for her dad who's trying to sell this up. First of all, there's no way in hell this murder house would still be standing 10 years after it ha- You're not going to try and sell the house. Tear it down. <laughs> build another house. Yeah. <laughs> Cut your losses. So she goes to drop off these keys and then he sees her and then he stands out in the street and watches her walk away. He does walk out the front door and stand in the street watching her. Yes. Yes. She's singing just the two of us. Yes. (laughs) And like you can hear the breathing that he's in the mask already. So it's very strange how many times there's this crazy, creepy guy in a mask just standing in broad daylight in the middle of the street. Breathing it up. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's not the, that's the first time, but the first time of many. But it is Halloween, though. He could just be in the spirit. Again, it's also just the stylistic choice. Again, I will have no problems with it, but I can see why some would. Well, because it leads to great shots, like when he's across the street. That's an amazing shot. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but it looks great. When he's in the laundry, come on, that's terrifying. And him just standing there staring at you is something that has been copied so many times in so many other movies. Absolutely. And here, I like the way that it's used. I also, what I like about this Michael Myers is that in so many of the sequels, he's like this big, massively built stuntman, like Mm -hmm. the characters always play Jason Voorhees. Mm -hmm. In this one, he's just a nice, lean guy. He's got some grace. Like, I love that bit when he's following Tom and he's just running his fingers along the fence. Mm -hmm. There's little bits there that you don't see show up in any of the other Halloweens. In Rob Zombie's Halloween, he is essentially Frankenstein. Like, he growls and roars. (laughs) Save Rob Zombie's Halloween for its own day. Yeah, let's not do that (laughs) at all. (laughs) Michael Myers in name only. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) But I like that there is this kind of normalness to him in terms of his physique, the way some of the gestures he does. But then there's also this complete inhumanity to the way he just stands there and stares to the way that when he kills Bob, he'll just sit there cocking his head from side to side. Uh, Yeah, yeah, like the robotic way he'll sit up when you think he's dead. Yeah, for sure. Slowly turn his head towards you. I was thinking, like, that's the big selling point for me with this movie, the normalness of everything. It's definitely, like, a suburban horror film, which is a big thing. Even, like, I was getting all arty in the beginning. When you see her house, I'm like, that kind of looks like the Nightmare on Elm Street house. And I'm like, that's kind of like the new castle. Like, in the old, like, Universal horrors would be the big castles and everything. That's our foreboding images in these horror films of that period. We have to think, I think the Amityville was also something that was big here in the late 70s. Absolutely. The big foreboding house and sometimes... It's not even that big, but just a suburban two-story house. Yeah. You know? Amityville had those windows, though. Those were terrifying. (laughs) Yeah. But what I like about Michael is you look at a lot of the kind of predecessors to slasher films, you know, Psycho, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, even Black Christmas. It's all about playing up the killer as he's manic and he's full of energy and he's doing all this dramatic shrieking and stuff like that. Even in Black Christmas, he's like shouting and gibberish and flipping tables and stuff. Mm -hmm. And this Michael is just so quiet. Yes. And just so focused. Predatory. And then he even does odd things like laying out the tableau of victims, like wearing the ghost sheet and glasses that there's no real reason for it, but he just does it. I watched that again. I'm like, Michael, that's some cold ass shit when he puts on the guy's glasses on the it's really it's a frightening thing to do. <laughs> but he's got he's he's whimsical. Like, I just have some trouble understanding him as a character because he's this like feral, crazy person when he's like jumps on the car with the nurse and he steals the car and he's like, He doesn't even know how to drive and it's mm-hmm. like, Well, someone must have taught him. So he's basically driving a car, and then he's also eating dogs like a feral animal. Mm -hmm. And then he's wearing funny glasses, and he's... I just... I I, want to understand him, or he has to be complete chaos. It's like, it's in this middle ground that I have trouble wrapping my mind around. I think, though, they're doing that as a counterpoint of they're doing all the feral stuff of, you know, he's crazed, he's maniacal, he's eating dogs, so that you expect him to be this crazy, maniacal character... And then that's countered by him being completely flat. Mm -hmm. And so it makes him even more crazy and unpredictable. He is a completely unpredictable character. It's true. Sometimes he's graceful. Sometimes he's very clumsy. Like he knocks the um, potting plant outside of the house that Annie's uh, babysitting at. Mm -hmm. Like I liked aspects like that. Sometimes he's calm. Sometimes you can hear the breathing. When he gets excited. Again, it's something I know doesn't work for everyone. 
for me, I love it because it's so hard to get a handle on. You can't mm. understand this guy. You can't predict what he's going to do. You can't figure out why he's doing what he wants to do. And to me, that actually makes it scarier. But he's not going completely crazy like Dario Argento does. He's still keeping it as subtle things. I just take Michael out of the equation for myself. I just think it's really effective, the, the scares and everything. I don't try to look too deeply into it. It's a well-crafted horror film, and I don't really need the logic per se in there. Like, another one of my favorite horror films is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I don't need any logic there. It's just well-crafted. I mean, I haven't seen that movie, but he's just a psycho killer, right? Who, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he's more just the loon waving around a chainsaw. Yeah, and that yeah. I understand. I mean, you know how much I love Jason. Yeah, that He just kills everybody. And he has that kind of, like, rage in him. I just don't understand him, and therefore I can't identify and I can't be frightened because it's kind of like, well, whatever goes. You know, it's like, I'm funny, and now I'm scary, and now I'm, like, I just, I don't like him, I think. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Do you like the Blair Witch Project? I thought it was okay. I think maybe you just don't like boogeymen. I think it's supposed to be the idea where you kind of fill in your own blanks. Yeah. And I think that does not appeal to you. Yeah, because lots of people were really scared of that movie. I, I thought I'm it was terrified scary. Of the Blair it Witch. didn't change me. Hmm. I went on a date. I never went out with anyone How except you. How dare you. But <laughs> <laughs> I went on a date with a guy to go see that movie, and he was literally in my arms. Like, he was so frightened. And I'm like, you're going to be okay? Or... I hid behind someone's <laughs> back. See, that's the thing. If you don't see it, then you've got it all building up in there. And I think that's why Michael Myers works that effectively for certain people. Like, everyone's different. And I think for those types of people, he works because you're kind of filling in the blanks with your own fears. See, and what I love is also that the kills aren't elaborate. No. There's oddly elaborate things in terms of Annie. She gets to the car, it's locked, she goes back to the keys, comes back, doesn't realize it's been unlocked, and then the breath has fogged up the windows. And then he just jumps up behind the seat, strangles her, and slits her throat. You know, and then with Linda, it's just he comes up behind her and strangles her. Mm -hmm. It's like the lead up to the kill is elaborate, but the kill itself is just a very simple death. Yeah, it's the tension. And I appreciate uh, that as well. Or Bob, you know, it's like the build up to Bob and then he just sticks a knife in him and he's done. And I don't like it when the kills are too grotesque, which is another reason I enjoyed this movie. Also, they didn't have the budget for makeup effects. but <laughs> Yeah, which I think would have been a detriment to it. Then it would have just been a cheese fest. Well, here's my question, Julia. Mm. Have you seen the Elm Street movies? Um, how many of those have I seen? You've seen all of them. I've seen With all Freddy of Gerner. them. Does that appeal to you more because he's someone who has more of an active personality? She's a Jason person. I like Jason. Oh, you see, and that's surprising me because Jason has zero personality. He has zero personality. He's just death. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are, he's going to oh, fucking kill you. Yeah, Jason doesn't do things elaborately. He just... If he comes across you, he kills you, and then he goes to the next person he comes across. Julia likes Jason because he's a victim getting revenge, so she understands his motivation. He has one motivation, and he's going to get revenge on the world. <laughs> <laughs> See, and that's the thing about Michael is he definitely has an endgame and a plan. He's almost like, it reminds me a little bit of Joker in the Dark Knight, mm. of how he's coming up with these elaborate plans, but you don't know what the hell they mean. But do you think he would stop after these three girls are killed? That's the open question. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what led to the series. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the fact that they answered all those questions actually kind of weakens it. I think just the fact that there is such an unknown quantity to Michael. Yeah. Why is he doing this huge elaborate plan? What is he building towards? And what did that ultimately do? There is no reason for it. It's just something that he did. And it ended up, you know, resulting in the deaths of three teenagers. Mm-hmm. Who have done nothing wrong. And, well, I mean, one thing that we should talk about is that whole, quote-unquote, virgin horror thing of, you know, the teenagers who have sex are the ones who get killed and the virginal one is the one who doesn't. Uh, yeah, but didn't this just, like, set the trend in this one? I mean, it's still not cool. Deborah Hill and John Garbutt actually get into it on the audio commentary where they said that was never their intention. Mm -hmm. Yet that's what a lot of people came away from the film thinking was their intention. And so it was copied. I just thought she was, like, more cerebral because she wanted to have sex. She wanted to get together with, uh, what's his name? She was a little bit afraid because she thinks mm -hmm. too much. So I didn't think it was really supposed to be punishing girls for their sexuality. Still, no, because, I mean, she's still doing reefer in the car, too, with, with exactly. the other reason. The way that they describe it is because she has a lack of confidence and a kind of sense of anxiety, that kind of social weakness that she has actually is her strength because it makes her more aware of her surroundings. Yeah, I think she, she's guarded as well. She's guarded. She's afraid. She actually you know, notices things. She doesn't brush them off. She dwells on things and thinks about them. And that's what leads her to uncover what happened in the house 
and also to then ultimately, you know, survive as she goes through this whole chain of circumstances. Absolutely. Because I think people like Annie and Linda were thinking about other things. They had their minds on everything else. Yeah, they were distracted. And that's what led to their demise. Because if I came in with a sheet on and I never said anything, you would think something was up. And they were so worried about thinking about what's cool that they didn't think about anything beyond that. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I love Linda and her obsession with the word totally. Yes, absolutely. PJ Souls is uh, I love her. <laughs> yes, how does this compare to her performance in Zuma Beach? It's a step up from Zuma Beach. It, Beach, it's uh, not... Oh, we're still calling it Zuma Beach. From now. Zuma Beach, okay. <laughs> uh, it's not quite Riff Randall. I think Riff Randall's her pinnacle. It's definitely her second best role. <laughs> well, my favorite scene in the whole movie is them walking home from school. Yeah, that was a very realistic, natural scene, yeah, with all three of them just kind of chatting and being normal people. Like, in a lot of horror films, you feel these people should be punished because they are intentionally playing the worst people on Earth. And in this, it's just, you don't want any of these people to die. They're normal people. They're not good, specific or bad specifically they're just people yeah and that's what i like about carpenter is that he builds characters that they don't fall into easy camps no nope. going back to the comments that i made in zuma beach and in terms of the writing of the teenage characters do you kind of see now what i meant by when i made the comparison to the way that the characters are written there reminds me a lot of the teenagers written in this movie oh for sure yeah so i can actually kind of see john carpenter's writing in there even though a lot of the teenage characters here were co-written by deborah hill who was bringing in a lot of her own experiences as a teenage babysitter in a small town it's absolutely true to life i remember my friends and i we would give each other the business over everything we weren't like paragons of virtue we would make fun mm -hmm. of each other and even just the snarky quips and everything the one in particular that stood out to me this time where she was just like we need to find a place to and then Lori says shit and she's like i have a place for that <laughs> and i'm just like well done <laughs> i also love speed kills yeah yeah that's pretty good as well <laughs> what'd you hang up on me for i had my mouth full well why did you call someone when you had your mouth full <laughs> because she doesn't think she just acts yeah. see that's the thing is they don't think Lori thinks that's why she's the hero and she's still taken by surprise. I know that there's like the two parallels between her and Nancy from the Friday the 13th, who is a more proactive character because she sets up all those traps for Freddy. But in this one, it's way more realistic. I don't think any of us would have acted that much differently. Oh, uh, Nancy was Nightmare on Elm Street. You said Friday the 13th. Oh, sorry. Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, <laughs> my bad. But I don't think any of us at that age would have acted too much differently than <laughs> Laurie in this movie. Right. And that's the thing is one of the other criticisms is that she isn't a very proactive character heroine either, but because of the long build of the movie, she isn't even attacked until the last 10 minutes of the movie. That's true. So, I mean, there is nowhere for her to be proactive, but even then, she's I mean, like when she runs up into the house and hides in the closet, it's not just her hiding in the closet. If you look at the scene, she goes, opens the patio door, so he'll think that she went out there, then goes into the closet, then takes a tie off, ties it around the door handles, then crawls into the furthest corner she can. So, I mean, she's actually thinking her way through the situation. Yeah. And wasn't it convenient that he waited in the hall for her to do all of that? That's true. He, no, he was knocked down, he? just wasn't he? stood in the hallway and waited. Well, no, no, because that was when he came up the steps. And then she makes so much noise in the closet. There's no way he would have thought that she went outside. He's like, rattle, rattle, rattle. I'm heading in here. Nope, nope, I went outside. I went outside. There was another door that he had to get through before he got into the room because she had the kids hide in the bathroom and then she locked herself in the bedroom. Right. Yeah. I still put forth that her reactive skills are better than my proactive skills. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to remember she's doing all this with her arm sliced open and a, probably a very nasty twist to her leg mm -hmm. from having fallen down the stairs. I think that she, like after mm -hmm. the movie's done, after the credits are done, I would like her to go back to that house that she begged for help for and mm -hmm. turned off their lights and burn it down. Yeah. <laughs> because that is complete lunacy. <laughs> that someone would see a teenage girl screaming for mm -hmm. help and then shut off their lights. That person is just as evil inside as the person that's chasing her outside. Because they think it's Halloween pranks, yeah. They might think it was a prank, but they would definitely call the cops. At the least, their cops would be in that area very soon. That would be right. one hell of a prank. Yeah, it would be one hell of a pointless prank. I like moments like that if you think, well, that's probably the crusty old couple who doesn't like the kids on Halloween, but they never set them up. Or like you have the character of, I believe it's Ben, who Laurie has the crush on. Mm -hmm. In a normal movie, he would be a character who appears on screen. He would maybe actually play a part in the climax. They would actually have an on-screen development of that relationship. Here, it's just someone who she mentions being interested in. Annie says, I'm setting you two up. And she's like, no, 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 don't set us up. And that's it. 
because that's just the stray part of normal teenage life, Mm -hmm. which ultimately doesn't have anything to do with the events that suddenly fall down on our characters. That's true. The events just happen. The chips just fall, and that's where we are. Like, there's no neat kind of package that this plot is put into. Right. How did Michael Myers get to six? How did Michael Myers get to six? Yeah, that's another question. Like, if he's this evil, was he like that all the way leading up? And uh, I know that they try to explain that in the uh, remakes. The way that it's supposed to be is that he was just a normal kid, and then that happened. And then he just switched off. I mean, it's just, it's like an urban legend of like, you know, the kid who goes crazy. He's the kid who snapped one day. Which, no. or it's the, yeah, Julia's not buying it. <laughs> no, I know. It's not meant to make sense. Again, it's one of those things, it, your mileage may vary. Yeah, they do sort of try to explain it in the later films to varying success. But, and then there's uh, the Rob Zombie film that makes an entire backstory out of it. Oh, uh, I was enraged. I hated that, that yeah, entire backstory. That was infuriating to watch. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Rob Zombie. Um, <laughs> I still haven't seen Halloween 2, and I'm going to have to here. It's pretty bad. It has one cool scene in the entire movie that's all, like, in black and white. Have I ever told you I also have the as-yet-unproduced Halloween 3D, written oh. by the guys who wrote my Bloody Valentine 3D? Oh, man. <laughs> but, I mean, Halloween, again, it's... I can't blame people for this film not working for them. It is so specific mm-hmm. in the way that it does things that that is not going to work for everyone. It's intentionally designed to work entirely on its own terms. And if those terms aren't working for you, it's not going to work for you. No, absolutely. If you think it's slow, you are right. My friend Angie, who goes to Midnight Movie Exchange with me, she just finds this film very slow and dull and doesn't make much sense. I can't blame her for it. It's like, as I watch the film, I can see those things that aren't working for her, but they work for me. For sure. It's interesting that the film has had the success that it has had, In that it is something that for a large chunk of the population, it just doesn't work. And as I said, when it first came out, despite the fact that it took off and became a success, most critics didn't have a clue what to do with this and tore it apart. Ebert was kind of one of the first ones to really say, you know, there's actually something here. Mm -hmm. And that's what started the kind of re-examination of the film. But even then, there were a lot of people who were like, it just doesn't work for me. But if you look at all the big, like, out-of-nowhere successes, they all kind of hinge on that. It's a love-it-or-hate-it sort of film. Like, right. Saw, like, Paranormal Activity, Blair Witch Project, they all kind of work on that. It works for some, really doesn't work for others. Well, and that's the thing about Blair Witch Project is it worked really well for me when it came out, but it hasn't held up. I don't think it would work on home viewing for me. I've seen it a few more times over the years, and I'm like, I still see what they did here. I can see why it took off. Mm -hmm. I don't think Blair Witch is going to have the lasting legs that Halloween has had. No, I don't think so either. But like Blair Witch was an event. I saw a midnight screening with very little information as to what it was. So it was as effective as humanly possible for me. On the other side of the coin, you have Nightmare on Elm Street, which is a film that works for a lot of people and doesn't work for me. Mm. You know, so it's one of those films of, you know... A lot of people, you're either going to be an Elm Street guy or a Halloween guy. I'm saying a Halloween guy. (laughs) And it's all dependent on style. For me, it's just the style, it's the pace, it's the atmosphere, it's Michael. It's a film that just works so much for me. But, I mean, uh, Julia, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts, because I know you don't hate the movie. No, not at all. It still just doesn't click with you? No, it's fine. I don't know what to say. (laughs) Go on, just what do you think about it? Like, what works and what doesn't? I really like the girls. They're my favorite. I would agree. I told you my favorite scene was when they're walking home from school. Mm -hmm. I still have a huge crush on Nancy Loomis. Yeah. (laughs) Who's Nancy Loomis? Annie. Annie. Which one's that? The one who's supposed to be PJ Souls. PJ Souls. No, wait, that's Linda. Yeah. Nancy Loomis is Annie. Oh, okay. I'm getting the names mixed up. The one with the butter and the laundry machine. The one who looks like Catherine Keener's younger sister. Yes. Yes. Probably why I have a crush on Catherine Keener, too. (laughs) It makes sense now. (laughs) I'm a PJ guy. (laughs) Well, I like all of them. I do question if Jamie Lee Curtis was ever young, because she's actually like a 30-year-old woman. Even she's a much, and very could much be a lady, 30. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is the other two girls were actually in their late 20s in this movie, and Jamie Lee Curtis was actually only 17. She looks 30. Yeah, she does. <laughs> she was just that kind of way. She's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> but she looks 30. But yeah, that and is this was her very thing. first movie. She had never done one before. Yep, introducing. I just found like the way it was shot and the pacing of it, and even just the time of day, mm-hmm. was like I was on the street with them. Mm-hmm. You know, like where you could feel 
smell the breeze. You could feel the sun coming through the trees, how it feels like to be done for a day of school, mm-hmm. to walk home with your friends. Like, I, I was never that cool. Mm-hmm. But, like, <laughs> I could have aspired to be, <laughs> to have friends that cool. That was really nice. All of the dialogue between the girls and even between anybody besides the part where it was looking for the killer, it was about the killer, or anything like that, the life parts were my favorite parts. Because I liked watching them watch scary movies with kids and make popcorn and do all of that stuff. That's the part that I like. Do you wish it was just like, was that Ethan Hawke? Like Zuma Beach in a small town? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would prefer if Michael just wasn't there. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone would. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it would work out best for everyone. Just another day in these kids' lives on Halloween. Absolutely. I would love to watch that movie. (laughs) Yeah, I think we should recut it. (laughs) (laughs) Halloween without Michael Myers. (laughs) Because he's really just getting in the way. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Zuma Beach, the inland life. But Michael just doesn't work for you, and that is what you discussed earlier, basically. Like, you don't like him because he's- There's too many holes. Too many holes. It's ineffective and it doesn't make sense. That totally is valid, man. Yeah. (laughs) But that doesn't mean there isn't- It's almost like he's a mouse through the cheese. Like, you have this beautiful, wonderful thing, and then Mm. he keeps- coming in and making holes mm-hmm. <laughs> you know we're like he's digging through or even the way they're acting is so natural and great like i want to go for a car ride with them and get high you know yeah. like i want to hear that conversation <laughs> i want to go to the dance tomorrow like that's where i want to be i don't want to watch this guy eating dogs and then saying he can drive stick because i don't believe it <laughs> this is another level i never considered before and now i'm seeing this movie in a whole different light no, it's actually a very interesting commentary and i said it as a joke but that this comes on the tales of zuma beach Mm-hmm. It does give it an interesting different perspective, showing how perfectly well they capture just normal teenage life in a small town. Another reason it's effective, you like these characters. It's the Carpenter yeah. difference. They're really natural and likable characters. Exactly. And then the Michael Myers element does swoop in and just prey on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also, you know, going back to that written review that I wrote for the script Prey, mm-hmm. there are elements from that, because that was a film that was done in 1975 and it never came about, that were actually worked into Halloween. Okay. It has three main characters, two of whom are kind of flighty, and the third of whom is more the cautious and aware one. They're three women, but they're in their early 30s instead of their teens. The villains of the piece, who are described often as the shape in the woods, are these looming, expressionless figures. You know, one of whom is a kind of small old man, the other of whom is like a big leather-faced guy. And Mm -hmm. there are elements of that where it's three women wander into the woods and encounter these guys. Okay. And this is more just that person comes into society and encounters them. Which is more preferable for me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm just reading this note that I wrote. <laughs> what? That says, Michael, heavy breather, light sneaker. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear him breathing down the street, but you can't hear him a foot behind you. <laughs> I think that's going to be his tag on I think the one time the dialogue for me rang a little false was when Linda was clearly, like, spacing out the time. She's like, who needs books? I got uh, science books. Yeah, I forgot my chemistry book. I always forget my chemistry book. <laughs> and my French book and my math book. <laughs> And I'm just like, you're just pacing it out so the car can get by. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, someone should have written a couple extra sentences on the fly there for her, because I don't think she thinks on her feet. She was doing a good job. And then the odd line of her boyfriend of, first I'll tear your clothes off, then you tear my clothes off, then we'll tear Lindsay's clothes off. It's like, whoa, hold on here. I have a theory about that. I think that the actor forgot which character was which, and he was referring to Annie. No, that's how it was written in the script. So it is in the script? Okay. I think it was just supposed to be stupid jock teenager saying stupid jock teenager thing. I think you should leave that guy. (laughs) Or else he's a little odd and we don't want to let him near children. Exactly. (laughs) I think they really could have saved their lives by just having sex in the back of that van. I don't know why they needed to go to another house. That was a killer van, man. That was a killer van. I would totally have sex in the back of that van. I don't need to go to my friend's house and have sex in a random bed. That's gross. The plot reason is that it's supposed to be October in Illinois. The noise. Uh, it's cold. Okay. I don't need to worry about that. We yeah, and, but, I mean, and that, that's one of the only problems with the film is it's set in Illinois in the end of October, and they shot it in Southern California. Well, you can tell, like it looks so warm. It's so lush and green. Yeah, and warm. it's very sun dappled. Yeah, <laughs> they threw some leaves around, but really, no. Yeah, they literally only had two bags full of leaves that they had to spray paint brown. Oh. And they had to style a lot of the street shots so that you wouldn't see palm trees. So, I mean, that's why it's so lush and vegetatious, is because they, they shot job. it in California. Yeah. A lot of dead grass, though. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's a heat wave or something. <laughs> but yeah, the plot reason why they couldn't just sleep in the van is because they want to sleep inside because it's warm. Mm. Oh, I don't think they were doing any sleeping. 
<laughs> so any other final thoughts on this specific film? A little foreshadowing to a future film we'll be doing. What film are they uh, watching, Noel? I believe The Thing from Another World. You got it. What's that? That is a, uh, I have actually seen the original. But you have or you haven't? I have not. Oh, I love the original. I've heard I it's love really good. The Thing from Another World. Yeah. That's uh, John Carpenter's The Thing is not entirely a remake of it, but kind of goes back to the story that it's based on. Like, You've um, seen The Thing. Yeah, I've seen The So Are They Looking in, in our, our Antarctica? We'll get into all that when we get to The Thing. Okay. I have a lot of things to say about The Thing. I think I'm for, I usually don't do much research because I'm lazy, but uh, I'm going to watch The Thing from another world before we watch The Thing for sure. The Thing is the one that scares me. You are scared by The Thing for sure. Yeah. I'm scared by The Thing. And then someone decided, let's make The Thing prequel movie. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I saw that. It was okay, for lack yeah. of a better word. We'll get to it. Yeah. <laughs> So before we move on to what we're going to do next month, unless does anybody else have any final things to say about Halloween? Uh, I'm checking my notes. Uh, staking out the Myers residence is a bad call. <laughs> I love that. Hey, Lonnie, get your ass out of here. That was one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's a big problem in horror films, especially in this one. No one believes Tommy. No one believes Lori. No one believes Loomis. No one believes anyone. <laughs> and I love they don't even believe each other. No, they're just like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong about this. He's here. No, he's not. <laughs> he's not oh, here. Oh, Tommy, yes, what do you mean there's a strange man staring at you? I wouldn't know anything about that. Exactly. Maybe just look out the window and check things out. <laughs> Julia, did you have any final thoughts? I'd like to mention the fantastic slacks that she wore one more time. I know it was a bit of a teaser in this movie. They're still great. I still love them. Which one? The ones that she had in the final Her act? Her last scene outfit where she has mm. the high-waisted bell-bottom pants on. I'm not even sure if they're jeans or not. You know, those worked really well on her, yeah. She looked fantastic. And I'm totally copying that outfit. You should. <laughs> also, her Lucite purse, the Lucite handles, her knitting bag. Mm -hmm. Love it. <laughs> I'm obsessed and I need to have one. I will get you one. I also wrote, what did I write? Because we were talking about Jason and we were talking about uh, Michael. I'm like, Jason's fun. Michael's so morose. That's true. He's a bit of a Debbie Downer. <laughs> Michael's sad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There should just be a, a meme of just taking all those shots of him staring at someone and say, sad Michael is sad. <laughs> just in brackets, size. <laughs> I'm so lonely. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing I'd like to bring up was once all the um, bodies of her friends reveal themselves and she's kind of like in the corner and then Michael comes out of the shadows, that is stunning. Yeah, the nice change in light cue, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That looks just amazing. <laughs> it looks fantastic. And I definitely do agree with you, mm -hmm. but it is that same thing that always happens in horror movies where we can see him and she can't. Yeah. And you're like... <laughs> you can actually sense someone in a room with Yeah, you. <laughs> but she can't because she can't even sense when he sits up and comes behind her after she thinks that he's dead. Yeah. And that's why I'm like heavy breather, light, light sneaker, because yeah. <laughs> I would not turn my back on a killer. It's true. <laughs> But, you know, it's a movie, so, it, like, you obviously have to have that, like, last like, little yeah. bit at the end. He's like a Westworld android. He just moves very <laughs> methodically. No, that's a reference I can get behind. Mm -hmm. Now, if only he had been wearing a painted white Yule Brenner mask. It's true. Then we would have had an even bigger hit on our hands. Yeah, we, we should detail that a little more, that the mask he's wearing is literally a William Shatner Star Trek mask. I had to explain that to Julia, because she did not understand. Yeah. <laughs> they took off the eyebrows and the sideburns and then painted it white and then kind of widened the eye holes. Mm -hmm. It is William Shatner. It's a wonderful or, homage. Or, or someone sculpting a cheap rubber mask to look vaguely like William Shatner. <laughs> so does William Shatner get money then? No. Yeah, I think they changed interested enough, maybe. I don't know. I don't think he even knew about it until, like, years later. Yeah, it was like an urban legend, as far as I knew. People would say that. It's so different that, I mean, it, it's not visibly William Shatner, so I don't think he can really sue for likeness. Yeah. I feel that he would. He seems the type. <laughs> How dare you? You're the man. <laughs> Either that, or he would be like, can you please pay me money to be in the next one? I need some. Yeah. I need to act. TJ I'm Hooker free. It's canceled. <laughs> <laughs> He should have taken over as the Professor Loomis Jr. I would actually like <laughs> after it. After Donald if, Pleasance died. If William Shatner was a uh, You don't understand. He's not human. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah. I think that's everything. Oh, what are we covering next? Now, before we get to what we're doing next, I just want to say I did also, in prep for this, I read both the script and the novelization. The script is pretty much the final shooting script. Uh, a few things are different, but that's just because they were dependent on the location, like in terms of how scenes are blocked out. And then they just kind of got whatever they could go with. And it also has Professor Loomis calling his wife at home to tell her not to worry about him. And Donald Pleasance actually specifically requested that bit of dialogue removed because he didn't feel that Loomis should be married, that she should have a life outside of Michael anymore. Good call on his part. And the novelization... 
One of the interesting things about novelization is for a few decades here, nobody's been sure who wrote it. It was written under the name Curtis Richards, and there's never been another book written under that name. Well, I mean, there's there's been other Curtis Richards, but not him. So the theories have been that it was either written by a guy named Dennis Etchison, who was a popular short story writer in the 70s and 80s, a friend of John Carpenter's, who also wrote the novelizations of The Fog and Halloween's 2 and 3, but the writing style doesn't really match him. Hmm. And then the other theory is that it's written by John Carpenter himself, because Carpenter had actually written a few prose stories before he got into filmmaking. Neither of these is true. Curtis Richards is actually a guy named Richard Curtis. <laughs> who got his start in the 60s writing cheap porno paperbacks, and then in the 70s was just kind of a freelance writer whenever they needed someone to help out with a biography or something like that. Or uh, he wrote a novelization of another horror film called Squirm, which is about humans suddenly come under attack from earthworms. Huh. His adaptation is actually really good. He actually really goes into it and fleshes things out more. He gets more into the characters' heads. He adds entire scenes of dialogue. One of the really neat bits, he has like an entire chapter chronicling Michael Myers' time at the asylum over the course of those 15 years about how he kind of starts going from someone who will openly talk about things to becoming quiet and quieter and how he kind of gradually takes over the asylum because everyone capitulates to him because anyone who gets in his way will just suddenly turn up either dead or horribly injured. And Michael will always get off scot-free because he's like, oh, he was in the other room, you know? Hmm. You can see early threads of what Rob Zombie would kind of do with his version. Yeah, I was going to say, that's very much what he was doing. But it's not done to that degree. Mm -hmm. However, the problem with the book is that he tries to get in Michael's head, and he explains everything. He actually does have reasons for why everything happens, but it's also all tied to sex and sexual things. He's excited as he's staring at the girls. He's literally jerking off the knife handle. Oh, I don't like that at all. That's in his belt. I mean, you can tell the author kind of came out of porn because he increases the sexuality a lot of everybody. It's not, it's a well-written book, though. I think it's a good adaptation. It's just, it's not the Michael that's on screen. But if you're someone who the Michael on screen didn't work for you, it might actually work better because it makes more sense. It gets into the fact that he has nightmares and hears voices. It, mm -hmm. it gets into this hereditary thing where he had a grandfather who once went crazy and, and went on a massacre. And then that ties back to ancestors in Europe who went crazy and killed people. And it's like this hereditary chain of just snapping. I see. And then it also works in this Celtic element that would be kind of played up in later versions, too. Samhain. There's actually some really neat bits where, like, Laurie and Annie, when they're in the car, actually just talk about masks and the masks that we wear and all Ugh. this thematic symbolism about masks. And it's actually really interesting dialogue. I, I really like some of the bits that he slips in. It's just Michael Myers himself is very different from how he is in the movie. He even wears a mask that's a bit more Frankenstein-y. It has, like, a scar and red lips and everything like that. Weird. <laughs> it's a good adaptation. It's not great, but it's a good one. And if you're a fan of the movie, it is actually worth tracking down. Right. It's a little hard to find, a little pricey, but it's if you're able to get it, it's, it's worth a read. Fair enough. So, on to what we're doing next month. Someone's Watching Me, which was Carpenter's own TV movie of the week that he actually directed himself. All right. And this one is, I've never seen this one before. Nor I. It's actually been unavailable until it finally came out on DVD here a couple of years ago. Cool. So, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, what did we learn today? <laughs> I've learned that I still love Halloween and it's okay to take criticism of something that I love. You and I can both just cuddle up and make a Halloween sandwich. It's true. <laughs> Julia, what have you learned today? Halloween. Hold the Michael. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we did. We weren't all like universally just like, yay, Halloween. Yeah, it'd be pretty boring. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So anyways, that brings this episode to a close. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Masters of Carpentry is a made-of-fail production. Made-of-fail.net. We were unpopular before it was cool.